Want to learn the entire contract law syllabus in under an hour? Welcome to our marathon session on the English law of contract. This podcast takes you through all the basics one needs to understand in order to prepare for an undergraduate law exam or the solicitor's qualifying examination. Challenge yourself to stick till the very end and make some notes as you are getting along. This podcast was prepared by Dr. Yanis Glinavos with the use of AI tools. Get in touch with Yanis, following the information on the video's description, to learn more about how this podcast was generated. The starting point in the study of the law of contract is formation. Formation of contract requires five distinct elements. Offer, acceptance, consideration, intention to create legal relations and certainty. A contractually significant offer is defined as a statement that is certain enough for the other party to accept in its entirety without the need for further discussions. An offer that invites the other party to perform a specific action is a unilateral offer. See for example the case of Carlyle v. Carbolic Smokeball of 1893. An acceptance needs to be an unconditional assent to the terms of the offer and cannot introduce any new terms or make any amendments. A purported acceptance that introduces new terms will not be considered an acceptance that leads to a contract, but a counteroffer as in Hyde v. Wrench of 1840. A request for information, however, as in Stevenson v. McLean, 1880. Consideration can be defined as an element of value contained in the promises made by the parties, Thomas v. Thomas, 1842. Without this value underlying the promise, the exchange will lack the necessary legal validity to be deemed enforceable in a court of law. Additional. Assisting to separate agreements that are significant and official enough to be enforceable, from those that are not, the requirement of intention to create legal relations plays a similar role to consideration. The difference between the two is that intention to create legal relations does not rely on concepts of value, but operates on the basis of presumptions to distinguish between social or domestic agreements and commercial agreements. Domestic agreements carry a presumption against enforceability, Balfour v Balfour, 1919, while commercial agreements carry a presumption in favor of enforceability. The final requirement, certainty, permeates the discussion as to formation of contract, as it works to ensure that the parties have a secure understanding of the contents and aims of their agreement. In examining the requirements of offer and acceptance a bit more closely, it is worth drawing a distinction between offers of a contractual significance and invitations to treat. An invitation to treat cannot be accepted and lead to a contract but operates as an invitation for someone to make an offer, which can then be accepted or rejected. While each case is judged on its particular circumstances, the following rules have been established with a degree of certainty. Advertisements in the press are considered invitations to treat, Partridge v. Crittenden, 1968, and only adverts with very specific terms that require the recipient to follow a course of action to obtain a named result will be deemed unilateral offers, Carlyle v. Carbolic Smokeball, 1893. Displays of items on shop windows, Fisher v. Bell, 1960, and shelves. Pharmaceutical Society of Great Britain v. Boots Cash Chemist, 1953, are also considered to be invitations to treat. Similarly, information posted online is considered an invitation to treat, and going through a process of ordering online makes the customer's action an offer to the shop. According to the e-commerce regulations of 2002, the shop then signifies its acceptance of the customer's order via emailing a receipt, confirmation. Offers can be withdrawn at whatever point before they have been accepted, however unilateral offers cannot be withdrawn once the other party has begun performance Errington v. Errington, 1952. Once an acceptance has been communicated the contract is immediately formed. Special rules operate for acceptance sent by post. The postal rule, Adams v. Lincel of 1818, stipulates that when an acceptance is sent by post, it is deemed to have been communicated at the time of posting. Keep in mind, however, that this rule does not apply to instantaneous forms of communication, e.g. fax, or email. Brinky Bond Limited v. Stahag Style 1983, and works only for acceptance. Having addressed formation of contract, we now move on to consideration. The doctrine of consideration is peculiarity of the English legal system in the sense that it is a mechanism used to determine whether agreements ought to be enforceable or not, on the basis of value elements contained in the promises exchanged by the parties. As such, the doctrine of consideration has no direct equivalence to the laws of continental jurisdictions. The doctrine is difficult to explain, principally because of the artificial manner in which it has been explained in the case law.
Early cases like Curie v. Mesa of 1875 described consideration as a valuable consideration in the sense of the law, may consist either in some right, interest, profit or benefit accruing to the one party, or some forbearance, detriment, loss or responsibility given, suffered or undertaken by the other. In Dunlop v. Selfridge in 1915 consideration was alternatively described as an act or forbearance of one party, or the promise thereof, is the price for which the promise of the other is bought and the promise thus given for value is enforceable. Perhaps the best way to describe what consideration is as something of value that needs to support the promises made by the parties to each other, as suggested in Thomas v. Thomas of 1842. Another way of putting this is to ask whether the action of the party was the result of the promise of the other. Talking of value supporting a promise however begs the question, what is considered to be valuable in the eyes of the law? Value is perceived in economic terms, but that does not mean that contractual promises need to contain the intention to provide what we would consider to be goods or money. Also, it is a mistake to think of value in terms of market value. Consideration needs to be sufficient but does not need to be adequate. This means that while some value is required to support a contractual promise, the extent of this value, adequacy, is irrelevant. We are looking therefore of something of value, not something offered matching market value. Even something totally worthless in normal circumstances could be considered sufficient consideration. In Chapel v. Nessel in 1959 the question came to the court whether used chocolate wrappers formed part of the consideration for the purchase of a record at a store. The court decided that even though the received wrappers were of no value to Nessel, this was irrelevant. A contracting party can stipulate for what consideration he chooses. A peppercorn does not cease to be good consideration if it is established that the promise does not like pepper and would throw away the corn. Therefore, anything the parties specify in their promises that is valuable to them, will constitute sufficient consideration. Even refraining from an action can constitute good consideration. In cases of settlement of actions or forbearance, a party may agree not to exercise a right against another, or not to pursue a claim, in exchange for some other benefit. Note however that forbearance will not be sufficient consideration if the alleged right is not existent or the claim is spurious as in Wade v. Simeon of 1846. The doctrine of consideration, apart from its role as a core requirement in formation of contract, has an important role to play in contractual modifications, crucially so in promises to perform actions already promised to the same party for additional advantages. While a classic view of consideration suggests that no further payment is due when a party performs duties already owed to the promisor, Stilk v. Myrick, 1809, the case of Williams v. Roffey Brothers of 1990 has introduced the notion of practical benefit consideration, suggesting that indirect benefits can constitute new consideration, even when the actual performance of the promise remains the same. Consideration is not the only tool that allows us to determine whether an agreement should be a contract enforceable by law. The English law of contract distinguishes between agreements by classifying them as commercial or social domestic. The way in which this distinction is played out in practice is by employing two sets of presumptions. Commercial agreements are presumed to carry the intention to create legal relations, while social or domestic agreements carry the opposite presumption, they are presumed to lack the intention to create legal relations. Both sets of presumptions are rebuttable. That means that if evidence is offered that go against the presumption, then the presumption can be overridden. These presumptions can be traced most securely to the case of Balfour v. Balfour from 1919. In this case a husband promised to pay his wife a monthly stipend of £30. When he refused to honour that promise the wife sued. Lord Justice Atkin decided that the agreement could not be enforced as it lacked the intention to create legal relations. He said that the common law does not regulate the forms of agreements between spouses. The consideration that obtains for them is that of natural love and affection, not something that counts in the courts. A way in which this presumption against enforceability can be rebutted is demonstrated in the case of Merritt v. Merritt from 1970. There, on similar facts to Balfour v. Balfour, the court found that there was in fact a binding agreement. What led to the presumption being rebutted? was the fact that the agreement was not an amiable one, made between a couple in good terms, but it had to do with arrangements agreed by the couple upon their separation. While however a number of examples exist of instances of rebuttal of the presumption in domestic and social situations, it is more difficult to find examples of rebuttal in a commercial setting. As we said there is a presumption in favour of the enforceability of commercial agreements. For a commercial agreement not to be deemed enforceable, 
one would need to demonstrate either that the agreement was still in the stage of negotiations, or that the parties in any case never reached agreement. Attempts to rebut the presumption in favor of enforceability for commercial agreements by inserting clauses in the contract that this agreement is not to be enforceable in the courts have not been successful. In Edwards v. Skyways of 1964, a company offered to make ex gratia payments to pilots who were made redundant. When the company refused to pay and the pilots sued, the court rejected the argument that ex gratia meant that the agreement was not enforceable. It decided instead that the meaning of ex gratia was that the company accepted no liability, but still the agreement carried the intention to create legal relations. The presumption in favor of enforceability was however effectively rebutted in the case of an undertaking that was classed as a comfort letter in Kleinwert Benson v. Malaysia Mining Corporation of 1989. Lord Justice Ralph Gibson analyzed the letter and concluded that only moral responsibility was meant. In a sense, the whole concept of a requirement for an intention to create legal relations to be present in the formation of a contract is a mechanism for checking whether agreements should be serious enough to be backed by the force of law. English law uses this mechanism via the presumptions discussed with the end result that some types of agreements, for example those between family members of friends in the course of everyday life, are kept outside the world of enforceable obligations. The doctrine of consideration for many commentators has a similar role of filtering agreements that ought to be enforceable, from those that exist purely as moral obligations. We normally understand contracts as bilateral transactions, but what happens if a third party is involved? The doctrine of privity is a corollary of the doctrine of consideration. The doctrine, as established in cases like Tweedle v Atkinson in 1861, requires that only the parties to a contract, those providing consideration in other words, can have rights and responsibilities under that contract. The rule as it operated historically led to a series of unfortunate conclusions for third parties with legitimate expectations under a contract. For instance, if one were to buy a bicycle as gift for his daughter's birthday and instructed the shop to deliver directly to his daughter's address a privity issue might lead to unexpected conclusions if the contract is breached. Assume that the shop fails to deliver the bicycle. The father is the one contracted with them and can sue for the non-delivery. However, as he is not the intended recipient of the bicycle, he would have trouble asking for damages additional to the value of the bike if his daughter had suffered further losses as a result of the shop's non-performance. The daughter on the other hand, would not be able to sue at all as she lacks standing, by not being part of the contract. To deal with such unsatisfactory results, the common law developed a series of mechanisms to overcome privity. In Beswick v Beswick, 1968, for instance a widow was not able to enforce a contract concluded by her husband in her capacity as the intended beneficiary of payments under the contract, even though the intention to benefit her was clearly stated. The solution found by the court, was to allow her to acquire standing to sue as the administrator of her husband's estate. In Shanklin Pier v Detail Products Limited, 1951, the court struggled with the privity rule that prevented a customer from suing the manufacturer of a product directly. The solution was found via implying a collateral contract that brought the consumer and the manufacturer into direct contractual contact. The law of agency had also frequently been used to offer solutions to an otherwise harsh rule. Other, frequently used, common law mechanisms include trust law and restrictive covenants. Dissatisfaction with the privity rule and the common law mechanisms for dealing with it led to statutory intervention in the form of the Contracts, Rights of Third Parties, Act 1999. The Act gave intended beneficiaries, identified in the contract, either directly or by reference, the right to sue in their own name to enforce the rights promised to them. However, the passing of the Act does not render the common law mechanisms redundant. The reason for this is that the Act allows contracting parties to exclude the Third Parties Act, therefore blocking third parties from suing under the contract. In such case, third parties are forced to resort to the common law developed mechanisms to find an avenue allowing them to sue. Additional rights in this area are given by other statutory interventions aimed to protect consumers. There is now, for instance, a statutory obligation on manufacturers to give guarantees of consumer products the same legal status as contracts in the Consumer Rights Act 2015. Having dealt with the key aspects of contractual formation, we move on to see what goes inside a contract. Contractual terms belong to two broad categories, express and implied terms. Express terms are those agreed by the parties as reflecting their agreement. Express terms become incorporated into contracts by notice or signature. Lestrange v. Graukarb 1934. 
When terms are incorporated by notice, it is crucial that notice is given before the agreement is finalized. Anything notified to the parties after the agreement has been finalized will not be part of the contract. In Olive v. Marlborough Court Hotel from 1949, terms and conditions of the hotel presented inside the rooms were not part of the agreement with the customer, as by the time the customer got the keys to the room, the agreement was already completed. Also, notice needs to be given before the time of contracting, but only reasonable steps need to be taken by the party seeking to incorporate the terms. If reasonable steps have been taken and the customer, for instance, has not bothered to read the information, then the contract contains those terms, even though the customer remains ignorant of them. Thompson v London Midland and Scottish Railway, 1930. What is considered reasonable, however, varies on the circumstances. Particularly serious clauses, also known as onerous clauses because they may impose significant burdensome obligations on the other party need to be notified with a higher degree of care. In Interphoto Picture Library v Stiletto Visual Programs Limited from 1989 a clause requiring the payment of a high late charges for the return of some material was deemed by the court not to have been incorporated. The normal steps to bring information to the notice of the other party do not suffice for terms that are so important that, as the court suggested, ought to have a red hand pointing at them, as Lord Denning suggested in Sperling Limited v Bradshaw in 1956. Clauses excluding or limiting liability will be considered clauses onerous enough to require this extra level of notification. Express contract terms are distinguished between warranties, conditions and anominate terms, depending on their significance and the consequences of their breach. Warranties entitle the victim of a breach to seek compensation in the form of damages. Breaches of a condition of the contract on the other hand entitle the aggrieved party to terminate the contract. The breach of an anominate term, Hong Kong Fur case from 1962, will lead to either an award of damages, or the right to terminate depending on the significance of the term on the circumstances of the case. Implied terms are those who become part of a contract, not because the parties have agreed to them, but via operation of law. There are two types of implied terms, those implied by courts and those implied by statute. Of those terms that are implied by courts, they can be terms implied by a court into a particular agreement to cover for instance some gaps that prevent the contract from being performed, or they can be terms that the courts have deemed of general significance, and are therefore implied to all contracts of a particular type. By far more common however are terms implied by statute, especially in the area of consumer protection. The Sale of Goods Act 1979 for instance implies a large number of terms to contracts for the sale of goods. Every contract of sale for example, where the seller is acting in the course of business, will have a term implied that the goods supplied are of adequate quality, section 14, regardless of whether the party specifically incorporated an express term in the contract to that effect. Whether parties can escape the effect of these implied terms depends to a large extent on whether it is possible to do so under further legislation like the Unfair Contract Terms Act of 1977 and the Consumer Rights Act of 2015. The significance of a breach of an implied term is usually determined by the statute inserting the term. The law reserves special treatment for a certain type of contractual terms that seek to limit or exclude liabilities. The main way in which exclusion clauses, the term is meant to include limitation clauses as well, are controlled is via legislation that has to do with the control of unfair terms. The main statutes in this area are the Unfair Contract Terms Act of 1977 and the Consumer Rights Act 2015. Before we look into these statutes however, it is important to highlight that common law mechanisms for dealing with exclusion clauses continue to be relevant. This relevance can be seen if one considers that before a clause is subjected to control designed to restrict the use of unfair terms, it needs to be decided that it is indeed part of the contract and that it does apply to the dispute at hand. Issues of incorporation and construction of contractual terms are therefore paramount in our understanding of the control of and effectiveness of exclusion clauses. For a term to be included in a contract, it needs to be properly incorporated either via notice or signature. If an exclusion clause is not contained in a document signed by the parties, and it has not been brought to the attention of the parties properly, being an onerous clause, that means that special levels of notification are required, then it will not be part of the contract. If it is not part of the contract then of course the clause cannot be relied on to restrict liability in case of some breach. Even if the clause is properly incorporated however, that does not mean that it will be relevant to the dispute at hand.
the courts employ a rule that restricts the interpretation of exclusion clauses that is called the contra pro frontum rule. According to this rule, as illustrated in the case of Canada Steamship Lines v. The King from 1952, for example, an exclusion clause will be interpreted against the person seeking to rely on it. Evidence of the court's reluctance to accept exclusion clauses that are drafted in a wide sense are cases where the clause was relied on to exclude liability arising from negligence. In the case of White v. Warwick, 1953, the court employing the contra pro frontum rule decided that as negligence was not expressly mentioned, the clause could not be construed in a wide enough manner to cover liabilities arising from negligence. Only if a clause is properly incorporated in the contract, and can serve to limit liability in the context of the present dispute, will an investigation of the impact of unfair term statutes be necessary. The Unfair Contract Terms Act of 1977 applies specifically to exclusion and limitation clauses and contains certain outright prohibitions, usually for consumer contracts, and subjects other types of contract terms to a test of reasonableness. The most high-profile outright prohibition is contained in Section 2 which prohibits the use of clauses limiting liability for personal injury or death resulting from negligence. Contract terms in business contracts containing limitations are checked via the test of reasonableness, Section 11. The Consumer Rights Act on the other hand applies to all contract terms, and not just exclusion clauses. Under its provisions, contract terms are subjected to a test of unfairness that differs from the test of reasonableness of the Unfair Contract Terms Act, least because it uses a series of notions of continental origins, like the requirement of good faith. While some contracts contain terms that are problematic, others suffer from fundamental flaws that can render them void. In order to void a contact for misrepresentation, for instance, one needs to establish the following elements. That a false statement of existing fact was made, and that it induced the recipient of the statement to enter into the contract. That the statement needs to be false to lead to a finding of misrepresentation is self-evident. However, it is not always easy to distinguish between representations and mere opinions. In making the distinction an investigation is required into the difference in knowledge between the parties, and the degree to which the maker of the statement has expertise that is important to the recipient, and the degree to which the information itself is significant, Bissett v. Wilkinson, 1927, Dick Bentley Productions Limited v. Harold Smith, Motors, Ltd., 1965. The status of the maker of the statement is also important, as what may normally be considered an opinion becomes a statement of fact when uttered by an expert, S. O. V. Marden, 1976. Once it is established that the statement is a representation and not an opinion, then it needs to be demonstrated that it is one of present fact, instead of a promise about the future. While it is possible that a statement is both a statement of fact and a promise in the sense that it forms part of the description of the goods, it is important to be able to distinguish them as the former leads to an action for misrepresentation, while the latter to an action for breach of contract. A statement that is a false one relating to existing fact needs to induce the other party to enter into the contract in order to lay the basis for misrepresentation. While it is not necessary that a representation is material, meaning that it would induce a reasonable person to enter into the contract, County NatWest v. Barton, 1999, if it is material it will shift the burden of proof to the defendant. In any case the victim of a misrepresentation is not penalised for not having taken up the opportunity to inspect for themselves, Redgrave v. Heard, 1881. However, if someone does investigate, then even if they lack the skills to understand the information presented to them, they will still lose the right to complain for misrepresentation because they did not rely on the statement, but on their own evidence. Remedies for misrepresentation depend on the type of misrepresentation identified. That could be fraudulent, negligent or innocent. Generally, the standard remedy for misrepresentation is rescission, but damages can be obtained as well in certain circumstances, most notably for fraudulent misrepresentation, using the tort measure. The victim is to be brought to the condition they were in before the misrepresentation occurred. The Misrepresentation Act of 1967 equated the consequences of fraudulent and negligent misrepresentation, while distinguishing innocent misrepresentation. Where the misrepresentation is innocent, the victim may recover damages, but may be barred from obtaining rescission, S2.2. In all cases, misrepresentation renders a contract voidable, so the onus is on the victim to seek reparation. As with all voidable contracts, undue delay may deny the right to any remedy. A special type of misrepresentation comes under the title of negligent misstatement, Hedley Byrne v. Heller, 
1964. Negligent misstatement is a tortious concept that allows someone to sue for damages a third party who advised them negligently to enter into a detrimental agreement. The key requirements are that the advice was provided negligently, and that the advisor was aware of the importance of his statements to the advisee. What happens when parties have not lied to each other but made a mistake? The law of mistake is a difficult area of the law because contracts are judged objectively. This severely restricts the option of saying, I was mistaken in entering into this contract and I want to be released. Despite this fact however, the law does allow for mistake to void a contract in certain clearly defined situations. The different types of mistake are common mistake, mutual and unilateral. Common mistake means that parties make the same mistake when contracting. Mutual mistake means that the parties are both mistaken but they made different mistakes. Unilateral mistake means that one party only has made the mistake. A mistake as to the formation of the contract, about what were the terms of the offer or acceptance, or what are the terms of the contract show there is no agreement due to lack of certainty and results in the contract never coming into existence to begin with. This type of problem is not what is usually meant to under the doctrine of mistake. The case of Bell v. Lever Brothers, 1932, decided that in order to set aside a contract for common mistake, that mistake needs to be fundamental. Where the mistake is one as to existence of the subject matter of the contract, or its identity then the mistake is likely to be fundamental. Justice Wright argued that a straightforward situation of mistake is one where, unknown to the parties, the consideration to be provided by one of them had ceased to exist or was illusory, such as a contract for the sale of a specific chattel which had been destroyed. In such cases the contract will be void and any money paid will be recoverable on the ground of total failure of consideration. A contract therefore for the supply of goods that were never in existence, or had perished will be considered void for mistake. Couturier Hasty, 1856. When however the mistake is not about the existence of the subject matter, but about some quality of the goods, it becomes more complicated to invalidate a contract for mistake. In Leaf v International Galleries, 1950, a mistake as to the identity of the artist who created a painting, failed to void the contract for common mistake. According to the court there was no mistake as both parties knew which painting the contract was about, they were mistaken as to one of the qualities of the painting, namely its creator, but that was not fundamental to allow the contract to be voided. The ability of equity to intervene in such cases to render a conclusion different to that achieved via the common law has been an issue of controversy. In Sol v. Butcher, 1950, the Court of Appeal under the direction of Lord Denning set aside a contract where the mistake was as to quality and equity, despite the fact that the common law had no effect on the contract. This inconsistency was addressed by the court again in Great Peace Shipping v. Savlira Salvage, 2002, where the court found that in the absence of an operative or fundamental mistake as to the nature of the contract, equity could not be relied on to rescind the contract. As a result, subsequent decisions tend to find a contract void for mistake when the mistake makes the contract impossible to perform. In cases of unilateral mistake the result of the case will depend to a large extent on whether it is the buyer of a product for instance who is wrong because he correctly understood offer but makes a mistaken assumption and seller knows this. On this set of facts the problem is limited to the buyer and the contract survives, it is simply a bad bargain. If however the buyer wrong because he misunderstood the seller about the terms of the offer and the seller is aware of the misunderstanding, then there is no agreement because buyer accepts something different from what was offered Smith versus Hughes, 1871. What happens when someone has entered into a contract under some form of compulsion and not of their own free will? In order to set a contract aside for duress, one needs to prove that an illegitimate threat was made that coerced the victim's consent, leading to them entering a contract against their wishes. Each of these elements has a specific legal definition that needs to be understood as a foundation to actions on duress. It is important to note that the majority of duress cases have to do with threats of an economic nature, and not threats of physical harm like in Barton v Armstrong, 1976. Where the threat is to exert damage of a physical nature, it is easier to establish that the contract was entered into under duress, as such threats are assumed to affect the victim's will. Requirements are more complicated where the threat is one of economic or financial harm. The very existence of duress for these types of threats was relatively recently recognized in cases like the Atlantic Baron of 1979. An illegitimate threat is one where something is threatened that exceeds the rights of the person making the threat and is used in bad faith. It is not appropriate to equate illegitimate with illegal. While illegal threats, 
like for instance the threat to cause physical harm, will be illegitimate, it is not certain that threats that are not illegal will be illegitimate. A threat to breach a contract for example is not illegal in the criminal sense, but will be considered an illegitimate threat that can lead to a finding of duress like in B&S Contractors and Design Limited versus Victor Green Publications Limited, 1984. It is also possible that threats that are legal, like the threat not to renew a contract, or not to do business with someone, will be considered illegitimate, if they are used in bad faith, to obtain an advantage not due to the maker of the threat, CTN Cash and Carry v Gallagher, 1994. The concept of an illegitimate threat therefore is distinct from the concept of unlawfulness or illegality per se. If a threat is identified as illegitimate, for it to lead to a finding of duress, it needs to be established that the recipient of the threat based his decision-making on the threat. It is not necessary that the threat was the only reason why the party entered into the contract, but it needs to be a major, central part of the party's decision. The threat needs to be in other words the operating reason why the party entered into the contract Barton v Armstrong, 1976. The consequence of duress is that the contact is rendered voidable. As with misrepresentation therefore, if action is not taken by the victim, then the contract survives. If the victim therefore does not as for the help of the court to set the contract aside for duress during what is considered a reasonable period of time, then the court will deny them any remedy and suggest that the contract has been affirmed by delay, Atlantic Baron. The remedy of course for duress, is to set the contract aside. Duress is an important element in cases of modification of contract, where it is necessary always to establish that the modification is a result of a voluntary rearrangement between the parties, and not the result of illegitimate pressures. For instance the court would never have reached the decision it did in Williams v Roffey, 1990, if the contractor had exerted the promise of an additional payment via threatening to delay his work in a way that would constitute a breach of contract. What happens if threats are not made, but someone is still under someone else's influence? The significance of the law of undue influence is to a degree diminished by greater use of duress to cover transactions entered into under inappropriate influences. The main distinguishing feature between duress and undue influence is the existence of a threat. An illegitimate threat is necessary for duress, but not so for undue influence. Undue influence is based on relationships that bring one party under the influence of another. When this influence results in the weaker person being taken advantage of, then a finding of undue influence will lead the resulting contract to be held voidable. Undue influence has been classed as being actual or presumed. Cases of actual undue influence are very close to duress. When someone abuses a relationship of trust and influence to bring another to enter into a contract that benefits the advisor directly, Williams v Bailey, 1866, the contract will be set aside. When the influence is not exerted however in such a direct manner, it is more difficult to reach a finding of undue influence. In order to simplify these cases, the courts have categorized them under different types of presumed undue influence. The presumptions operate on the basis of types of relationships. The two key cases in this area are Barclays Bank v O'Brien, 1993, and Royal Bank of Scotland v Etridge, 2001. Under O'Brien the Court of Appeal classified undue influence cases as belonging into the following categories. Class 1 Actual undue influence, Class 2A Presumed undue influence, Class 2B Relationships of trust and confidence. The significance of this classification lies in determining where the burden of proof lies. In class 1 undue influence needs to be proved by the claimant, in class 2a and 2b the claimant only needed to prove the existence of the relationship. In Etridge the court doubted the classifications for presumed undue influence and restated the position as follows, for the presumption to arise the claimant needs to prove the existence of the relationship and the transaction needs to give rise to suspicion, only then the burden of proof passes on the respondent. This change in the rest of the decision in Etridge has very significant consequences on the behaviour of banks and the dealings with guarantors of loans, especially when the guarantor is a family member. Indeed, most contemporary significance of undue influence is found in financial transactions involving guarantees for financing. What Etridge has meant for loan providers, like banks, is that they are put on notice of undue influence when the guarantor of a loan is a family member. The majority of cases in this are, like Etridge itself, involved an investigation of bank liability for guarantee agreements entered into by wives to protect the enable loans taken out by their husbands. Etridge specifies that in such deals, the bank is put on constructive notice of any undue influence, unless they took steps to ensure that the wife was in receipt of independent advice.
Even though this appears at first sight, as requiring a major reassessment of bank behavior, in practice it has meant that the banks need to satisfy a technical requirement that has hardly changed the position of the weaker party in these transactions. Making sure that the wife obtained advice for instance, does not guarantee that the advice was of adequate quality. Most people do not immediately appreciate that it is not possible to contract about everything. A number of categories of contracts that are unenforceable are identified in the law. Those range from those that are void due to a formation defect like duress, undue influence or mistake, to those that are illegal in the sense that they violate statute or have been concluded between parties who lack capacity. The most important category of illegal contracts from a practical point of view is that of contracts that seek to restrict parties' freedom to contract with others. These are known as contracts in restraint of trade. A restraint of trade clause in a contract seeks to limit or restrict the ability of one of both parties to carry on some trade or business or profession. The reason for including such a restriction in the contract is to prevent existing interests from being jeopardized by future behavior. Most commonly, these are found in situations where a company seeks to prohibit workers from leaving and setting up their own competing businesses, taking away clients and expertise. The courts however have been habitually reluctant to allow such clauses to operate for two main reasons. First of all, courts are concerned that allowing wide use of such clauses may result in parties in a weaker bargaining position, bargaining away their right to work in the future, and therefore jeopardizing their livelihood, to obtain some short-term advantage, perhaps sparked by some immediate need. Secondly, the courts are reluctant to limit someone's expertise and to isolate valuable skills from the use of the rest of the public. Of course, the courts are also always reluctant to allow restrictions to the principle of freedom of contract without adequate supervision. As a result, clauses that seek to restrain trade are prima facie void, and the courts only allow them to stand where it can be demonstrated that they are reasonable in the circumstances. Herbert Morris v. Saxelby, 1916. What circumstances make a restraint of trade clause reasonable depends on whether the restraint is limited to achieving its state purpose, which is to protect a legitimate interest. Merely preventing potential competitors from setting up business is not a legitimate interest. Further, the restraint needs to be reasonable in the public interest, in the sense that either the public benefits, or that the public is not unduly restricted by the limitation in the choice of workers or suppliers. As regards employee restraints, a clause will never succeed where its sole aim is to prevent legitimate competition, and where the outcome of its operation will be to prevent the employee from working. Clauses, however, that seek to protect trade secrets and client connections from being lost to the business when a high-ranking employee leaves the business are more likely to be seen as reasonable. Therefore, it is safe to assume that restraints are more likely to be effective for highly specialized types of work, Leeds Rugby Limited v. Harris, 2005. Also, narrowly construed non-solicitation clauses that aim to protect the client base of a business from being eroded when employees leave and take their contacts with them, are likely to be upheld as in G.W. Plowman v. Ash, 1964. In summary, clauses that seek to limit freedom of contract to protect the interests of prior contracting parties are only accepted so long as they are reasonable and confined to limited time periods. Examples include non-competition clauses for traders once they have excited a distribution agreement with a particular supplier, S.O. Petroleum v. Harper's Garage, 1968. At this point we should also answer the question of whether everyone is able to enter into contractual relations while the main principle behind the development of the English law of contract is the principle of freedom of contract. The law recognized for very early on that certain categories of people ought to be protected from the consequences of the decisions to enter into contracts. The law draws a basic distinction between the capacity of natural persons to enter into contracts and that of corporations. For natural persons there are three classes of people who may be affected by an incapacity to contract. Minors, defined as people under the age of 18 when the contract was formed, people who are drunk, at the time when the contract is formed, and mental patients, defined as those suffering from a mental illness at the time when the contract is formed. One of the key categories of special interest are minors. Generally, contracts with minors are likely to be valid, if they are not deemed exploitative. According to the Family Law Reform Act 1969 everyone under the age of 18 is considered a minor. Contracts with minors belong to three categories, valid, voidable and unenforceable. Contracts for necessaries, defined as appropriate items for the minor's life stage, will be enforceable. Therefore there is nothing preventing a minor for instance from buying milk for her breakfast. However, the minor is only liable to pay for goods actually supplied, 
and even then only obligated to pay a reasonable price for the product or service. Clements v. London and Northwestern Railway Company, 1894. As a result, a contract to receive some service, like tuition, cannot be enforced against the minor, and she can recover the payment if the service has been paid for, but not provided. Miners Contracts Act 1987. In fact, contracts of service will only be enforceable if beneficial to the minor. A minor will not be held liable, even if she is found in breach of the conditions of contracts concluded. Proform Sports Management Limited v Proactive Sports Management Limited and another, 2006. Corporations or companies are recognized by law as having separate legal personality. That means they can enter into contracts under their own name and have rights and obligations. As however the corporation needs to act through a human agent, there are limits as to who can act on behalf of the corporation. Corporations therefore act through persons connected to them operating as their agents. Historically, when a corporation exceeded what it was entitled to do, then it lacked the capacity to enter into the contract in question under the ultra vires doctrine. In the case of companies incorporated under the Companies Act, the company would be prevented from doing anything not included in its objects clause. Any ultra vires act therefore would be void and unenforceable by any of the parties in the transaction. The rationale behind the doctrine was the need to protect investors, creditors and any third parties from entering into transactions with the company. The position under the common law and the original versions of the Companies Act has been amended by statute, pursuant to European legislation, in order to allow companies to acquire new powers to contract to reflect the changing nature of a business and its trading environment. According to Section 40 of the Companies Act 2006, any transaction decided by the directors of a company will be deemed within the capacity of the company if the other party is acting in good faith and free of any limitations under the Memorandum of Association. Parties to transactions with companies therefore no longer need to inquire as the company's capacity to enter into transactions before concluding contracts with them. All things come to an end, and so do contracts. One of the ways in which a contract can come to an end is when its performance becomes impossible due to an external event, not related to the actions of any of the parties. This is called frustration. For a contract to be frustrated, one should focus on the nature of the external event and search for any provision in the contract to that effect. The law of frustration is meant to operate as a default situation, to apply when the parties have not already decided how to deal with any particular events that may disrupt their contract. As the main operating principle of the law of contract is the principle of freedom of contract, the parties are welcome to arrive at their own allocation of risk and determine who should bear the burden of things going wrong. Such clauses are known by many names, the most common of which is a force majeure clause. In summary therefore, the existence of a force majeure clause that covers the event that has prevented the performance of the contract will prevent the contract from being frustrated. The typical situation regarding frustration is that which has to do with the destruction of the material foundations required for the performance of the contract. If for instance in a contract for a musical performance, a venue is specified, and this venue has been destroyed due to no fault of either of the parties, then the contract will be frustrated as happened in Taylor v. Caldwell in 1863. Similarly if the contract is about the performance of a personal service and the worker becomes unavailable due to illness or accident, if provision is not made in the contract to deal with the absence, and if the absence is significant in the circumstances of the case, then the contract will be frustrated. Hart v. Marshall and Sons, 1978. It is significantly more complex to argue frustration when it is the commercial purpose of the contract that has failed. In order for the contract to be frustrated what is required is a total failure of the commercial rationale backing the project. In Krell v. Henry in 1903 for instance a booking of a room to view the king's procession was rendered pointless by the cancellation of the procession. However, in Hearn Bay Steamboat v. Hutton, also in 1903, a booking for a boat ride was not deemed to be frustrated. Even though the booking was related to events that had been cancelled, the multiple purposes behind the trip meant that the purpose has not totally failed in a way that would render the contract frustrated. In a similar vein to frustration of the commercial purpose, if changes in legislation render the contract unenforceable, this will serve to frustrate the contract as in Fibrosa Spolka v. Fairbairn in 1943. A contract however will not be frustrated if the events leading to the inability to perform are under the control or caused by one of the parties. Instances of what is called self-induced frustration will not operate to discharge a contract. In Lauritsen as V. Weimuller BV, 1990, a company was denied the right to consider the contract frustrated, 
because it was its decision as to the allocation of its workforce that caused its inability to perform the contract. The consequences of frustration are that the contract is declared discharged. Under the common law, any money paid before the frustrating event could only be reclaimed for total failure of consideration. This situation has been amended by the Law Reform, Frustrated Contracts, Act 1943 which provides that money paid under a frustrated contract need to be returned unless reasonable expenses have been incurred or a valuable benefit has been given. Contracts also come to an end when breached. Breach of contract is one of the most fundamental parts of the study of the law of contract, as it opens the way to understanding methods of dealing with disputes, and also enables parties to draft contracts better by understanding how to avoid disputes. Whether a contract is breached or not depends on whether the performance differs from what has been agreed. Performance could deviate slightly or performance could be lacking completely. The consequences of breach depend on the seriousness and extent of the deviation from the prescribed performance. Contract terms are distinguished between warranties, conditions and anominate terms, depending on their significance and the consequences of their breach. Warranties entitle the victim of a breach to seek compensation in the form of damages. Breaches of a condition of the contract on the other hand entitle the aggrieved party to terminate the contract. The breach of an anominate term, Hong Kong Fur case from 1962, will lead to either an award of damages, or the right to terminate depending on the significance of the term on the circumstances of the case. When the term being breached is not one expressly incorporated into the contract by the parties, but is implied by statute or the common law, then its significance is either determined by the implying law, or it is dealt with as an anominate term, whereby the consequences of the breach determine the seriousness with which the term is treated. For example, a breach of Section 14 of the Sale of Goods Act 1979, on the qualitative elements of goods being sold, is treated as a breach of a condition entitling the consumer, if they so wish, to terminate the contract. The consequences of breach of Section 13 of the Supply of Goods and Services Act 1982 on the level of care and skill expected of a professional when providing a service, however will be judged according to the level at which the service deviates from reasonable expectations. A slightly substandard service will require damages as compensation while seriously defective service will enable the customer to terminate the contract. When a party to a contract declares, before performance becomes due, that they do not wish for the performance to take place, this is called an anticipatory breach. The fact that one of the parties wishes to withdraw from the contract should not bring to mind concerns as to contract formation, as the issue is only one of refusal to perform. Faced with such refusal to perform the other party is faced with two options. They can immediately terminate the contract and seek damages, or they can continue with the performance of the contract and then pursue an action for an agreed sum, in essence seeking their invoice to be paid. As the case of White and Carter v. McGregor testifies, however, seeking to continue with the contract will not be a viable option unless performance can take place without the cooperation of the other party, and unless there is a legitimate interest in performance. This legitimate interest will normally need to extend beyond the purely financial. An artist for instance will be interested in completing a commissioned piece of work as it will be an example of his capabilities, as well as a means of generating a profit. The way the law deals with breaches of contract is via remedies. The purpose of damages in contract law is to compensate the claimant for losses they have suffered as a result of the breach. It is important to note that the purpose of compensation therefore is not punitive, to punish the defendant, and does not extend in the majority of cases to compensating the claimant of the inconvenience caused by the breach. It is imperative therefore that a claimant demonstrates loss caused by the breach, before considering a claim against the defendant. One of the main issues in seeking compensation for breach of contract is the extent to which losses can be covered by the claim. There are two main mechanisms in the law that determine how far can one expect losses to be recovered. The first mechanism is called causation and the second remoteness of damage. Causation is a factual determination that utilizes a simple, but for, test. Would for instance the victim of the breach have suffered this loss, if it were not for the breach? If the answer is that this loss has been caused by the breach, then the second mechanism, that of remoteness, comes into play. If the loss claimed for is not causally related to the breach, it cannot be recovered. The concept of remoteness of damage has been analysed in the case of Hadley v Baxendale in 1854. There the court offered a two-part test to be used in separating claims that can be recovered from those that cannot. Losses naturally arising from the breach of contract, meaning losses occurring on the normal course of events, will be compensated. Losses on the other hand that do not occur naturally, 
will only be recoverable if the possibility of this loss arising was within the contemplation of the parties at the time of contracting. For instance, it is normal that if a taxi does not show up to collect a customer, the customer will need to find another way of getting to their destination, using perhaps another taxi service. It is not however necessary that someone who is delayed in reaching the destination will miss making an important business deal. While therefore losses of the first type will come under the first part of the Hadley test, losses of the second type will only be compensatable, if the possibility of that loss was within the contemplation of the parties. In the example given, this would mean that the taxi driver would have been told of the reason for the hire, namely to attend an important business meeting. The reasoning of Hadley was applied in the case of Victoria Laundry Limited v Newman Industries in 1949. In that case the defendants failed to deliver a new boiler to a laundry company for a significant period of time. Due to the delay the company lost business including a valuable contract with the army that they would have the chance of obtaining if they had the new machines installed. On application of the remoteness test, the court found the defendant liable for loss of business incurred by the laundry company in the normal sense, but did not find the defendant liable for the loss of a potentially very lucrative contract, as that possibility was not within the contemplation of the parties. An associated limitation on claims for damages beyond the requirements of causation and remoteness can be found in the victim's duty to mitigate. When seeking alternative performance after a breach of contract, the innocent party is obligated to obtain reasonably priced alternate performance. This means that the victim of a breach cannot use the fact that there has been a breach as an excuse to obtain very expensive alternatives, British Westinghouse Electric and Manufacturing Limited v Underground Electric Railways of London, 1912. There are three main bases for assessment of damages in English law. Expectation loss, otherwise known as loss of bargain, reliance loss, and restitution. The normal measure for assessing damages is that of expectation loss, where the court seeks to place the victim of a breach, to the extent that money can do it, to the position they would be if the contract had been successfully performed. In determining how to arrive at a specific amount representing a party's expectation loss, the court will use one of two main measures. The first one is called diminution in value, and the second cost of cure. When assessing the diminution in value the court will look at the value of the promised performance and deduct from it the value of the actual performance rendered. The difference represents the amount lost by the breach and this is what gets awarded to the victim of the breach to place them in the position they would have been if the contract was performed properly. The second measure, cost of cure, asks how much it costs to repair the problem, or to arrive at the promised performance. While the two measures most of the time give identical amounts, it is possible that the cost of cure differs substantially from the difference in value as demonstrated in the case of Roxley Electronics and Construction Limited v Forsyth, 1995. The claim there involved the incorrect construction of a pool. While the difference from the prescribed performance did not alter the financial value of the property, the cost of rebuilding the pool to the original specifications was very high. Reliance loss seeks to compensate the claimant for expenditure instead of seeking to place them in a hypothetical position where the contract is properly performed. Claimants may opt for this measure when it is difficult to assess what the chances of success of a project are, or when future profitability is too speculative. For instance, a claim involving the loss of profit from a film production is not likely to be successful, when a claim for lost expenditure is more readily proven. Anglia Television v. Reed, 1972. Restitution is a concept found in many places in court decisions in the area of breach of contract, but it is commonly associated with actions that seek to retrieve benefit given to the other party for no performance at all. These cases, known as instances of total failure of consideration, Fibrosa Spolker v. Fairbairn in 1943, show that such benefit can be retrieved using this restitutionary remedy. Also, restitution is associated with cases where the normally available measures, expectation and reliance loss, lead to unsatisfactory results. In Attorney General of England and Wales v Blake in 2001, the court found that the state was entitled to the remedy of an account of profits from the defendant, because this was the only way to redress the harm caused by his breach of contract. Similarly, the concept of a hypothetical release, assessing damages on the assumption that the claimant would have put a price on a right that was used by the defendant, used in Experience Hendricks LLC v PPX Enterprises, 2003, is used to offer a solution where the choice of the court would otherwise be only to award nominal damages. Nominal damages are a notional amount, one pound for example, that signify the court's agreement that there has been a breach of contract, but offer no compensation as no loss has been proved. 
Quasi-contract is a term used to denote situations where a party may be seeking a remedy that does not fall within the normal headings of damages for loss, but where indeed a contractual obligation existed that mandates the payment of reasonable compensation. Situations that come under this heading include losses caused beyond the effects of a breach, where the contract is defective on formation, for instance due to a mistake that renders it void, where a contract has not been formed, but a benefit has been passed from a party to another or because work has been performed under an agreement with no specific details as to payment. A typical situation where quasi-contract will be at issue is that of actions to recover payments made for total failure of consideration under a restitutionary claim. Restitution is a concept found in many places in court decisions in the area of breach of contract, but it is commonly associated with actions that seek to retrieve benefit given to the other party for no performance at all. These cases, known as instances of total failure of consideration, Fibrosa Spolka v. Fairbairn in 1943, show that such benefit can be retrieved using this restitutionary remedy. Recovery for payments made under a mistake of fact are also possible. For example, when an insurance company makes a payment on a policy that is defective, recovery may be possible as in the case of Kelly v. Solari of 1841. It is not possible, however, to recover payments made under a mistake of law, as ignorance of law is not considered an excuse. Some recent movements in this area of the law suggest, however, that recovery may be possible in certain circumstances even for a mistake of law as in Nerdin and Peacock plc v. D.B. Ramsden Limited of 1999. Another common situation of so-called quasi-contract is that of Quantum Meruit. A claim on Quantum Meruit, as in Planche v. Colburn, 1831, can be made for work that has been performed outside a contract. For instance if a worker is building an annex to a house and provides material and work, if for defective work, the landlord terminates the contract and dismisses the worker, there may be no claim for payment if the contract was entire. Entire contracts are those that require a contract to be performed fully before payment is due or recognized in English law, Cutter v Powell, 1795. If the landlord chooses to use some of the material left behind by the worker, then he will need to offer reasonable payment to the worker, despite the fact that no payment is due for the performance on the rest of the contract. Guess what? Just like this, you made it to the end of our marathon podcast on the English law of contract. Thank you for listening till the end and good luck with your exams.